running? Good. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start right now. Okay, start. Start by okay. raising your voice. Welcome back. 600 seconds. <laughs> That's 600 you're never going to get back again. <laughs> But to speed things up further, I'm just going to say that Bob Zubrin is well known to many people. He's the president of the Mars Society and one of the real innovative folks that I've ever known in the entire history of the space program. Uh, and he takes a resolute view of everything and very practically so. Uh, and today, he's going to talk not so much about spacecraft, but about economics. Thank you. Um, and in the interest of self-interest, uh, I'll begin with a commercial. Um, uh, this is a great conference. Uh, the Mars Society is going to have what we hope will be a great conference in Boulder this year, August 15th through 18th. Uh, you're all invited to come. Uh, and in fact, there, since there are many people here who've got a lot to say, you're invited to submit an abstract and speak. Uh, there's all the information you need at marssociety.org. So I'm um, going to talk about the economics of interstellar breakout. Um, how do I advance charts here? Okay. How do we get from here to there? And I won't be able to cover all aspects of it, but I'm going to cover uh, a couple of, of, of what I consider the critical aspects of, of making it possible for us to uh, break out to the stars. Okay. Now, if you talk about an interstellar mission, um, fairly minimal one, actually, uh, and I'm talking about a human interstellar mission. Uh, let's assume that you want to have a ship velocity of 10% the speed of light so you can make it to nearby stars in decades, that is, uh, so that you can have a single generation ship where the children who are going to do the colonization can have direct cultural inheritance from the people who start the mission and so a sense of the mission can be preserved and uh, perhaps be able to accommodate 100 people to start a, a minimal colony, you're talking about a ship mass on the order of 1,000 tons. Okay, so 1,000 tons, 10% the speed of light. Okay, the kinetic energy of the ship is 125 trillion kilowatt hours. Okay, at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, that boils down to 12.5 trillion bucks. Now that's just for the energy at 100% efficiency, okay? Now, there's more than energy involved in a mission. There's the ship itself, and, and there isn't 100% efficiency. So at a minimum, we would think that the actual cost of the mission might be 10 times that, okay? And that would be optimistic, but we'll take that. That's $125 trillion for the mission. By comparison, the whole U.S. Apollo program in today's money is about $120 billion. So the cost of this mission is a thousand times as much as Apollo. Okay? A thousand times as much. Now, so for a society to be able to launch such a mission with a social cost uh, comparable to that that Apollo represented for the human race in the 1960s, it would have to have a thousand times the GNP for it to represent a comparable cost. Um, now, of course, you know, I mean, societies are capable of greater sacrifices than Apollo was for us. World War II was certainly a greater sacrifice for us than Apollo, and so forth. But nevertheless, in terms of order of magnitude, that's what you're talking about. And um, so, how do we get to a society with a thousand times that of 1968 or? about 200 times that of today. Is it really possible that we could have a society with that level of economic output? Uh, there's various uh, you know, Malthusian philosophers who say that it's absolutely false. Yeah, you can't do that. We're going to use up all the resources and so forth. Um, well, let's take a look at the data from the past to see how reasonable these people are. Okay. Now, this is data that shows that Malthusian theory is completely wrong. Um, okay, the, uh, here we have data from the past 500 years, and what you see in the black boxes is GDP per capita. In the uh, blue little diamonds is the world's population. 
and uh, in the world population certainly has gone up. But far from going down as population has gone up, human well-being has gone up, and in fact it has gone up at a faster rate than population. That is, not only has product gone up faster than population, product per population has gone up faster than population. And we'll come to that in a minute. And so, for instance, to see the absurdity of the Malthusian prediction, let's take a look at one of the most famous ones from uh, 1968. Uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote his famous book, The Population Bomb, in which he said, here we are, it's 1968, there's three and a half billion people in the world, there's going to be seven billion by the year 2000. Uh, you know, there's hungry people in the world today, they'll be starving in the streets by the year 2000 unless we have population control. And forget about India and China, they just got to go down the drain, they're hopeless. They'll be starving in the streets in the United States unless we impose a one-child policy here. Okay. So here, 1968, is the Ehrlich prediction. As population goes up, well-being will go down. Okay? The, uh, now, in fact, he was pretty close to being correct about his population projection. Ehrlich was not wrong about his projection of future population. It took till 2010 for us to reach 7 billion until 2000. But all things considered, that's a fairly accurate projection. Okay? But he's completely wrong about what happened to human well-being. Instead of gone down, it's gone up spectacularly. Okay? Now, okay, everyone has the right to be wrong about the future. But Ehrlich was also wrong about the past. Because if his theory okay, that uh, human well-being was inversely proportional to human numbers was correct, then people should have been much richer in the past than they were. And for instance, Ehrlich was born in 1931, okay? Uh, and if his theory was correct, people should have been much, much richer in the 1930s when the population of the world was uh, almost half of what it was in 1968. But instead, of course, they were much poorer, okay? He would have been around to see the rich world of, of the 1930s, okay? But it didn't there. The world was much richer in 1968 than it was in the 1930s. And here's the Ehrlich prediction for the world of the past compared to what the world of the past actually looked like, okay? And so this is what marks this theory to be completely counterfactual and its promotion being that of, of charlatans because they're not even looking at the available data. They're refusing to look at the available data, including the data they experience directly. Now, on this chart here, okay, I'm actually graphing GDP per capita against population itself. Okay? So, in time is simply marked along the line. And what you can see is that at any point along this line, if anyone had made a Malthusian prediction here in 1968, as Ehrlich did, or in 1950, or in 1900, they would have been equally incorrect. Okay? It goes exactly the opposite way. And in fact, what you have here, okay, here uh, in 1800, this is when Malthus himself was writing, the world GDP per capita in today's money was $180 and the population was one billion. Now it's seven billion, and it's $9,000. Okay, so the population has gone up by a factor of seven. GDP per capita has gone up by a factor of 50. Okay, which is it's gone up as population squared. And total product has gone up as population cubed. Okay, so Malthus was spectacularly wrong, and all of the people who have followed him have been equally wrong. Now, okay, so the Malthusian theory is counterfactual, but why is it false? It seems uh, to a naive person on the surface that it should be true. If there's more people, there's less to go around. Why not? Well, okay, for one thing, every mouth comes with a pair of hands. But if that was all there was to it, then it would be a wash. More people, less people, it'd all be the same. But there's more to it than that. Every mouth comes not only with a pair of hands, it comes with a brain. So the more people there are, the more inventors there are, and the faster the rate of technological innovation. Now, furthermore, the more people there are, 
the greater the division of labor, which makes it easier to produce things. The more people there are, the great easier it is to construct infrastructure necessary for the economy to function. And the more people there are, the larger the market. So the easier it is to justify investments to implement new technologies. So the more people there are, the faster the rate of both technological progress and economic growth. Okay. And uh, there's uh, more to this even, which we'll get to shortly. Okay, now if you want to look at the math, okay, Ehrlich and Holdren, his protege, who is currently President Obama's science advisor, um, uh, are famous for an equation, which is I equals PAT impact, which is to say badness, whatever that means, is proportional to the product of P, population, A, affluence, and T, technology. So people are bad, affluence is bad, and technology are all bad. Okay. Now, I have a completely different viewpoint. Okay, well, for what they call affluence, I call living standard, same thing. Okay, that's the gross product divided by the population. Okay, technology is what multiplied by population is the gross product. And if you do a little bit of algebra, you find that affluence equals technology because the amount of product there is per person equals the productivity per person on average, period. Okay, so they are the same. Now, furthermore, Okay, if we look at the, the previous figure, we had a uh, technology that is living standard growing as population, well, squared, okay, over the whole period. If you look at certain parts of the period, you could get n as to the 1.6 power uh, or some number in between, depending upon which section of that line you choose. Uh, so, uh, Okay, the rate of growth of population, which I use as P underscore because Microsoft Word doesn't allow you to use P dot, okay. Um, for, um, okay, but okay, so P underscore, which is P dot. Okay, the rate of growth of population is in proportion to population. And if you put these two equations together and do a little bit of calculus, you find that the rate of growth of technology equals P times T to a certain power, and if n equals 2, that is if technology is growing in proportion to population squared, for example, uh, this simplifies to the rate of growth of technology is proportional to the size of the population times technology itself to the 1 half power. Okay, if you chose uh, the 1.6 here, this would be to the 0.4 power. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't really change things that much. Now, this makes sense. The rate of growth of technology is certainly proportional to the population because it's people that create technology. Technology is created by human man years of effort. But of course, also, some people are better equipped uh, by their circumstances of life, by their education, okay, by their political freedom, which is also part of this large concept of T. That is, T technology includes not just scientific knowledge, like it includes not just knowledge of printing presses, but actually having printing presses and having people free to use printing presses, okay? Uh, and ditto for railroads and all the other apparatus that one might think of, okay? Uh, so uh, the, 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 the better educated people are, the freer they are, et cetera, the better each person might be uh, situated to contribute to technological progress. So it's a product of these two. This is, uh, mathematically derived, but it, if, if looking at it on the face of it, it is a, a very rational uh, formula. Okay, now, the other thing, of course, is technological progress is cumulative. Okay, we live as well as we do today, not only because of all the people that are living today and contributing to the global market and division of labor and, and making investments and doing all that, we live as well as we do today because of all the people that have lived in the past. I mean, imagine that Malthus had been actually listened to by people in power and they had been effective in imposing his ideas as policy and there had been only half as many people in the world in the 19th century as there actually were. So you could get rid of either Thomas Edison or Louis Pasteur, take your pick. Okay, either give up electricity or give up the germ theory of disease in modern medicine. Your choice, okay, it's up to you. Now, the other thing you see here, okay, you'll notice uh, I have two different graphs here 
they have two different scales. This goes from zero to $400 as GDP per capita. This goes to 9,000, okay, because on this graph you can hardly see what's going on in earlier epochs. This is person years of inhabitation of the Earth since the year 1 AD, okay? So, because technology is created by human effort, which is measured in man years or person years, if you will. And, okay, so what we find is between the year 1 AD and 1500, there's only a very limited increase in well-being per capita on the globe. Then there is an inflection point at 1500s. This is changing. Now we get some pretty determined progress upward to 1800, and then things just absolutely take off. Now what happens in the year 1500? In the 1500, the world is unified by the introduction of the long distance sailing ship. Prior to 1500, there is no world economy as such. Inventions made in China can take hundreds of years to reach Europe. Okay, inventions made in Europe, like horse-drawn carts, take thousands of years to reach the New World. Okay, but after 1500, with the introduction of the long-distance sailing ship and, and the putting it into effect, it only takes a few years or at most decades for inventions made anywhere to reach everywhere. Okay, so up till 1500, Chinese society is progressing slowly on the invention of uh, pretty much of inventions made in China, and up and European society is progressing largely on inventions made in Europe. If they get Chinese inventions, they're coming hundreds of years late. Okay, you know, Arabic numerals take 1,200 years to go from India to Europe, for example, um, and, and so forth. But now it's instantaneous. So now progress is, is much better. And of course, if there's a, a, a fallback in any one locality, it's, it's quickly replaced because the knowledge can come back from somewhere else. And then, of course, in 1800 and in the years afterwards, we enter the world of steamships, railroads, telegraphs. And, and, and so forth, and knowledge that can be transmitted around the world in days, uh, goods can be transmitted around the world in months, and then finally in the 20th century we have radio and the internet and all of that. Okay, so uh, there you have it. Uh, so, uh, in short, uh, okay, now there's another aspect of this, which is energy. Now this is going to bother some people, but it has to be said. Because what I've graphed here is human well-being against global carbon use, okay? And it's pretty clear, okay? Carbon use has gone up, well-being has gone up, okay? And if you say you can stop this show, okay, and we're going to go back here to 1990 levels without a negative impact on human well-being, then you are in denial, okay? The, uh, okay, now... Well, what about global warming? Maybe there's global warming. I'm not a meteorologist. But let me tell you this, okay? I was born in 1952, and my memories go back to about here. I can remember Sputnik, beep, beep, okay? And in my, the lifetime of my memory, okay, and I'm not that old, okay, the world has gone from $2,200 GNP average okay, to 9,000. When I was a little kid, my parents were telling me they can eat my food because children were hungry in Europe. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Now, so we've gone up a factor of four since then. Has this been accomplished at the cost of a climatic catastrophe? Well, there are many people here who can, can remember what the climate was like in the 1950s. Maybe some of you can't. And for those of you who weren't around then, let me tell you what the weather was like when I was a boy. <laughs> when I was a boy, the weather was about the same as it is now. Okay. So uh, this needs to continue. $9,000 a year. This is a tremendous achievement relative to where we've come. I mean, this is the world over here of Victor Hugo uh, you know, and Charles Dickens where people are starving to death in the streets of London and Paris, the world's leading countries at the time. And now we've gone up, up from that. But still, 9000 a year, that's $4.50 an hour wage. That's pretty low and half the world's below average. We need to continue this 
for another 100 years. We take this up another factor of 10. We went from $900 a year in 1910 to 9,000 now, go to 2110, get to 90,000 a year, okay. Now, now you're talking. Um, we need to do that. Uh, but it's going to go along with increased energy use and increased population okay, to accomplish this. You need more people to accomplish progress, and you need more energy use. Now, uh, how much more? Well, if we want to get to a GDP of 200 times today, and if GDP per capita goes up as population squared, so GDP goes up as population cubed, then we have to take uh, the population up by a factor of the cube root of 200, uh, which is like six, okay? So what we're talking about uh, in 200 years is a human population of order of 40 billion people. Now, if they were all on the earth and you scattered them equally on the earth, that would give you a population density equal to that in England today. And by England, I mean England, not the United Kingdom. I mean the actual part of it that's called England, which is the higher standard of living part of it, um, and is generally considered a very pleasant country to live in. Um, now, of course, if we're talking 200 years from now, they don't all have to be on the Earth. We've got lots of space in space, okay? That's one thing that a resource that space is very rich in is space, okay? Um, but, um, the, uh, but what about energy? Well, if we're talking about growing the economy at this sort of rate, here is the kind of power use that we're talking about. So here in the present, we got like uh, 15 or maybe 18 terawatts today. Um, okay, and then it's going to go up as humanity progresses. Okay, this is a very good thing. Okay, this means that the sons and daughters of Chinese peasants are going to college and, and not only graduating so they can buy cars, but becoming scientists and engineers so they can contribute their intellect and talent to the general progress of mankind. Uh, but this is the requirements that we're talking about. We're talking about over the next 200 years increasing the uh, energy use by two orders of magnitude an order of magnitude per century, roughly. Um, okay. Now, do the resources exist to do that? Okay, and just to point out, what we're talking here in 2100 is having used 7,000 terawatt years of energy compared to today, taking into account this exponential growth, and 96,000 a century later. 7,000, 96,000. All right. Well, if we talk about known terrestrial fossil fuels, and this is, by the way, is not all the fossil fuels, and even estimated unknown terrestrial fossil fuels. Well, there are 7,000 terawatt years in estimated unknown terrestrial fossil fuels. It could be more methane hydrates and stuff. But there's enough fossil fuels currently estimated to get us a century uh, with that kind of exponential growth, not at current rates, but with exponential growth. Uh, well, what's next? Well, there's nuclear fission. Okay, nuclear fission with uranium without reprocessing is only comparable to currently known fossil fuels, but with reprocessing, it's much more. And if we bring in thorium, then it's considerably more. So now this now is already enough energy to cover you for two centuries and more. Uh, now, thorium fuel is not a futuristic thing. We have a reactor at Shipping Port in Pennsylvania that's running on thorium right now. So there are a lot of people going around with books about thorium right now as the revolutionary new fuel, and it does represent an important resource, but we're not talking about a technology that is even beyond our present capability. Okay, now, and then of course there's fusion. Uh, now, the most preferred form of fusion is using deuterium with helium-3. Now, deuterium is, is, is widely available in the ocean. There's unlimited quantities of it, essentially. Helium-3 is not available on Earth at all. Um, the, there's some on the moon, and if matched with deuterium, it would give you 10,000 uh, terawatt years of uh, energy. Uh, but there's much more in the outer planets. Jupiter's got the most, but there's plenty in the three other outer planets. Okay, enough for just 
thousands, I mean, in other words, you're talking about, uh, remember, we're at, we're at 100,000 or 96,000 to get us two centuries. Okay, here we're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of times that available in these planets. So it's a big resource. Now, if you were to envision um, a craft, which I called a NIFT, a nuclear indigenous fuel thermal rocket, and this could be a nuclear fission thermal rocket like the NERVA, or it could be a fusion thermal rocket using fusion energy to simply heat hydrogen that would be drawn from the atmosphere of these planets. These planets all have predominantly hydrogen atmospheres. Okay, and you were to make a rocket with them and attempt to achieve orbit, okay, the, uh, and taking advantage of the rotation of the planet and all that, what you find is the mass ratio of the rocket to achieve orbit on Jupiter would have to be 24, which is, pra is impractical, okay? Uh, but on Saturn or these others, it's like four, which is entirely practical. Uh, and so it's possible to build single stage to orbit vehicles that use nuclear thermal propulsion that could leap out of the atmosphere of Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune and reach orbit and thus acquire helium-3 in the atmospheres of these planets. They'd be able to cruise and fly in the atmosphere of these planets just using thermal rockets to heat the atmosphere as a jet and fly around and collect helium-3 through some separation process and, and then take off and fly to orbit where they could be met by other craft which could ship the helium-3 to wherever it needs to go. So, uh, so I think that this is... Um, this is what's going to make the outer solar system the Persian Gulf of the, of, of, of the solar system uh, for humanity 100 years hence. Uh, now, where am I going? Excuse me. Um, all right. Now, deuterium helium-3 of any substance known in nature has the highest energy per unit mass. Okay, antimatter has more energy per unit mass, but it's not found in nature. You have to make it with energy from something else, and currently that's done at an efficiency of 10 to the minus 6. Uh, but the, uh, if you have a deuterium uh, helium-3 fusion, uh, you can make a rocket out of that. Uh, if you, uh, it could be either be magnetic confinement or inertial, but either way, use a magnetic nozzle to repel the plasma away from it. Um, if you dilute that plasma with other mass, for example, hydrogen, you can lower the specific impulse and increase the thrust, um, and that would be done for interplanetary travel um, or to, for instance, move uh, what I call asteroids, which are asteroidal kind of objects made of volatile material like frozen ice or ammonia or whatever, okay, which you might want to do for terraforming purposes or for other reasons. Uh, but if you actually want to go to the stars, uh, you want to get the highest possible exhaust velocity. Uh, the deuterium-helium-3 reaction gives you an ideal exhaust velocity of about 7% the speed of light. Uh, and if you take into account inefficiencies that are likely to exist in a real rocket, maybe you could get 5% the speed of light as an exhaust velocity. With appropriate staging, rockets can be built to achieve about twice their exhaust velocity. For example, um, space shuttle main engine has an exhaust velocity of about four kilometers a second, and to achieve orbit, the shuttle went to eight kilometers a second. So with various uh, engineering techniques, you can uh, get a, a ro staging and so forth. You can get a rocket up to about twice its exhaust velocity. So if you have a rocket which can do 5% the speed of light exhaust velocity, you can make starships that have 10% the speed of light final velocity, and then once they get up to speed, um, I believe that uh, interstellar uh, spacecraft could be slowed down using a magnetic sail, which is basically deploying a loop of superconducting wire in interstellar space, creating a magnetic field, uh, using that, it, 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 basically that would repel the interstellar plasma that would create drag. Interstellar gas would be ionized and turned into plasma and repelled. It's just like the solar wind hitting the Earth's magnetosphere and, and it goes around it. M many of you have seen diagrams of that kind of thing. Okay, well, that actually creates drag against the Earth. Fortunately, not that much, so we're not falling into the sun at the moment. But, the, um, but it could be used to slow down an interstellar uh, spacecraft 
at down to velocities of you might call interplanetary class velocities, at which point more conventional propulsion systems could be used to maneuver to the planet of interest. So, and, and, and I might comment on this. Fusion uh, is a promising energy source for, for Earth. Um, the program was going fairly well until the 1980s when it was internationalized. Uh, and no, I mean that, but it's, I worked in the fusion program. And um, until the, the mid 80s, we had a rather dynamic program because of national competition of the US program against the Soviet program, the European program, the Japanese program. All four were constantly trying to upstage each other at conferences, showing their latest results, their plans for the next machine, and so forth. And this put some competitive drive into it. Uh, around 1985, the bureaucrats from the different countries got together and said, why are we doing this wasteful competition? Let's merge our programs into this thing called ITER, the International Tokamak Experimental Reactor. It then took them 30 years to agree on where to put it. Uh, but they went to a lot of fun meetings in the meantime in Kyoto and Geneva and you know, everywhere. Um, and. Uh, and, and, and the progress basically stopped after 1990 when no new national machines were made. But uh, we're moving into a more affluent world and just as uh, we're now seeing privately funded spacecraft companies, I think we're gonna see privately funded fusion companies uh, because there'll be people in the private sector who have the resources to give this kind of thing a try. And I, I think we'll have much more determined kind of programs, focused programs, and I think it will eventually succeed. Uh, but, you know, fusion, the other thing about fusion is, uh, well, put it this way, steam engines were first uh, developed for um, pumping out mines of water, but they didn't really become efficient until they were developed for the purpose of propelling steam boats. And nuclear reactors, the first practical incarnation of the nuclear reactor was to propel submarines, okay? And uh, I think developing fusion reactors for space propulsion might put the discipline on it to make efficient, inexpensive fusion reactors that could then become available uh, for commercial utilization. So I, I think there's, there's an interplay here between uh, technology that's developed for space flight and space flight make, using that technology to make uh, much more available various resources for Earth and as well as practical energy source for Earth. And as that technology is developed towards its limit, opening up a path to the stars. So, but I, I wanna come back to my original point because the, the, the main issue here is the continuation of progress, okay? There, there's really two ideas in contest right now on, on Earth and uh, they have very different consequences. Ideas have consequences. Okay, there is this idea, which is essentially anti-humanist, uh, which is uh, that the world's resource resources are fixed. And so each additional person is a detriment to the well-being of everyone else. And every nation is fundamentally the enemy of every other nation, and every race the enemy of uh, every other race. Um, and uh, we should all try to keep each other down, okay? And, you know, uh, and the, the, the only outcome of this worldview can be stagnation, tyranny, uh, war, and genocide. And in fact, we've seen this uh, in, in the 20th century. Hitler, 1941, the laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live, okay? You know, and, and if these ideas are accepted now, they could lead to the worst disasters you could possibly imagine. I mean. If these ideas are accepted by the Chinese leadership, for example, then the existence of the United States is intolerable because we're 4% of the world's population, we're using 25% of the world's oil, okay? On the other hand, and, and if these ideas are accepted by American strategic thinkers, they can have uh, nothing but animosity towards the rise of China and other third world nations to affluence because now they're gonna use up the oil that we want and so forth, okay? But if you take the other point of view, that human beings on net are creators. And, and by the way, th this idea is demonstrably true because if human beings on average destroyed more than they created, there'd be nothing here, okay? There, it must be the case that humans on average must create more than you destroy. But it, and if you embrace that truth, then you see every new person born on, in the world as potentially a friend, every nation 
potentially and fundamentally the friend of every other nation. The US is the greatest friend of China, not just because we buy their DVD players, but because that 4% of the world's population is producing half the world's inventions. It's true, they are. Okay, but we can be proud of that, but we'd be a lot better off if the Chinese were doing their share. So it's really good for us if the sons and daughters of Chinese peasants go to the university and become scientists and engineers so they can start contributing their talent to the over uh, general flow of human progress. So we're not enemies at all. Okay. Because the real resource is human creativity. Okay. That's the real resources. So, the, and, and, and the only thing sustainable is progress. Any, if you try to enforce stasis on society and it, it limit us to one particular technology or form of resources, yeah, but then that one will run out. It is the capacity to create that creates resources. I mean, look at our own society today, okay? You know, I, I live in the West, in Colorado, and, and there are some antique stores there. And if you go into a real old West antique store, what you will find, everything there is made of either glass, wood, carbon steel, leather, natural fabrics, maybe a little bit of brass. Okay? You go into Target, what do you find? Well, you find those materials, but you'll also find stainless steel, aluminum. No pioneer of the Old West ever saw a piece of aluminum in their life, okay, despite the fact that aluminum is the second most common element in the Earth's crust. Okay, it was unknown to science till about 1810 and unknown to people at large till the 20th century. Okay, we got aluminum, we got plastic, we got synthetic fibers, we got fiberglass, okay, uh, we use gasoline, uh, you know, and we get power in part from uranium, and we use devices that make use of silicon, okay? Uh, and in this, you know, I, I've got more books in the Kindle app on this thing right now than they ever had in the University of Colorado library until the 20th century, okay? Not to mention access to the internet and millions of more books, um, the, 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 and so forth. In other words, we've created all, the, the very substance, the, the materials of our civilization, most of them were unknown 150 years ago, okay, literally. And so we create resources and we have to maintain faith in the human capacity for creativity and invention, okay? And that is the definition between believing that we're living at the end of history or the beginning of history. Because I think that's where we are. I think we are at the beginning of history today. Okay, this is the time that will be remembered because this is when humanity first set sail of other worlds. I think humanity has an enormous history in, in front of us. You know, we have 5,000 years of written history right now. Where are we going to be 5,000 years from now? 5,000 years from now, we're going to be all over the galaxy. Okay, all over the galaxy. This is the beginning of history. So we can make it to the stars, provided we remain free. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'd like to take some questions. Right here. Getting the resources. 
bullet to explode at this point. Okay, so you're not going to be plugging the stuff into your power grid in order to launch it. You're going to be learning how to use new resources. And I think that's partly what you were saying as well. Well, yeah, but also, I mean, we're going to have to be throwing around energy at a, a much greater scale and, and manipulation of matter than is now. I mean, look, you know, I've got a car and, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 horsepower. 100 horses. How many people owned 100 horses 200 years ago? Okay, I mean, the, 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 only the wealthiest pe people might, and, and, and no one would attach 100 horses to a coach. Uh, and the, so, you know, we flew here on a jet, and, and who knows how many horsepower were on that jet, okay, that drove me here. Okay, and the, the, so, my point is that it's going to have to be a much more potent society disposing of energy and matter in a much more potent way than is, is conceivable by our current society. And uh, because if you did have that kind of energy and you had a poor society, you would use it for terrestrial uses. You would not uh, use it to launch interstellar missions. Um, so it, you know, the numbers that I'm using are obviously rough because even as I said, Apollo itself was hardly the maximum effort that the U.S. of 1968 could have devoted to a project. We devoted a lot more to World War II. But, the, but, but still, it gives you some sense of, 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 of what this means. And, uh, you know, to me, the primary precondition of uh, interstellar civilization is a larger, freer, much more affluent, and, and much more potent civilization than the one we presently have. But I think if we look at where we've been, and if we continue doing that for another 100, or perhaps if we do it for another 150 years, we'll hit Freeman Dyson's deadline on the nose. Okay, uh, that is, that's a pretty much an on-the-nose uh, prediction based on the energy requirements and the rate of human progress over the uh, since the Industrial Revolution. David. Okay, um, let me ask to summarize your question. Uh, there were two parts, one that dealt with the uh, utility of solar energy instead of just fusion, and the other uh, was a more complex uh, uh, point that, uh, I don't know how to put it, that, that somehow I am uh, caricaturing uh, the, the zero growth advocates. Okay. Well, but put it real crystal because I want to recapitulate it for people. I mean, if you could, the, the, I, I, let me just answer you. You said that the, there's various things that I've, I've left out. Well, yeah, uh, and actually, 
I have a whole book on this subject, by the way, um, <laughs> called um, Merchants of Despair, Radical Environmentalist, Criminal Pseudoscientists, and the Fatal Cult of Anti-Humanism, which, uh, okay, uh, I would, uh, encourage everyone to read because it answers this question at, at great length. Okay, but 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 let me try to answer. Number one, I'm all for solar energy, not by trying to make fossil fuels more expensive so people are forced to use solar energy, but by the advance of science. And I'm convinced, by the way, that in 30, 40 years, some time uh, in this century, maybe much sooner, but sooner or later, that we will have. Uh, the potential for economic solar energy for certain applications. It's not very good for base power because it goes on and off when the sun goes up and down. That's kind of hard to get around. But certainly for various things, and it will significantly expand our energy use. Um, fusion as a fuel that you can take on board is, is, is better as a portable uh, power source and one that you can rely on 24 hours. Now, the, uh, now your other point, which is more complex, um, Ooh, where do I go with this? Uh, I had a debate two weeks ago, May 13th, with an individual, okay, a professor, Kafaro, from a philosophy from Colorado State University, uh, who considers himself a very progressive person. He's the head of a group called Progressives for Immigration Reform. And he says that the United States needs to stop all immigration in order to help stop global warming. And the reason is, is because when people come to the United States, they become more prosperous and thus their carbon footprint increases and therefore this must be stopped. Uh, I will leave it to people here to decide if this is a progressive point of view or not. Okay, um, the, the exact same argument could be used for segregation or for any method to depress human living standards and uh, limit opportunity. It's not a straw man, this is a real man. Um, <laughs> okay, um, but... Okay, I, 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 what I'm saying is this, okay, okay, all right, yeah, this isn't a debate, but I'll just state my position, okay, because as I say, it's, it's stated at much greater length in this book, which everyone can get on Amazon. Um, <laughs> the, um, okay, uh, it's a question of where you stand, okay. Okay, I think this is good. Okay, I'm for this. I want to continue this, okay? There may be effects on the climate that this has caused, okay? The people debate the data, but maybe the ones who say that it has caused a degree of warming are correct. I think that in view of all the good that this has caused, it should be continued, okay? That's what I say. Now, there are people who take a different point of view, but so long as the standard of living of the world is $9,000 a year, who here makes less than $9,000 a year or would like to? Okay the, 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 okay, the biggest problem in the world today is poverty. Poverty, it's not global warming, it's not terrorism, it's poverty. Poverty kills people it, through starvation, through disease, through ignorance, through brutality, through a, every mechanism you can think of. This. Can, this is a great thing that we have accomplished here. Okay, I say this show must go on. And for some people, they say, well, no, I'm satisfied with how things are. Well, are you satisfied? Would you be satisfied with how things are if you were at the world average? Would you be satisfied with how things are if you were at half the world's average, which half the world's population is? Okay, okay it, it's a moral question, okay? But where I stand is uh, I'm for this. Okay. okay, others can be against it. And re moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. It's a great job. Thanks a lot.